Hi, guys. Hello. Good to see you. And thanks for joining with us today. Yeah, it's an honor. And congratulations. You know, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Pretty cool year. I was there. I was excited for you. You were there. Yes. Thank you. Very excited. Well, you're in good hands. You've got Mr. Joe Costello with you. He's there an indeed. expert at this. He's an old pro. Yeah. So yeah, we'll leave you. Joe. Pro Joe maybe. Not, knows. not old. Not old. As they say, Joe, knows. Joe knows. Joe knows. Joe knows, uh, Joe knows drag racing, right? Oh, you guys, there it is. There it is somewhere. I got one of those. Hey, everybody. We got Greg Anderson, the winningest pro stock driver in the history of drag racing, joining us here on EPAR Trade Industry Week. If you're out there on Racer, uh, wherever you're watching, if you can add to the chat section, you got a question for Greg, by all means, put it in the chat section. There are millions of questions that we could ask this guy. Uh, but I'm just super excited. Thank you for your comments and questions for Antron Brown. Uh, we're doing like an hour and a half straight of NHRA talk, Greg. So this is great. Uh, you, what a year. Um, you know, inside stuff for drag racing fans, we do it on, on my show. This is a different audience, Greg. Like we've got, you know, Formula One people, FIA people, sports car, uh, everywhere. And I, I just love talking about drag racing and pro stock in particular. Um, I think it's underappreciated how much technology, effort, uh, goes into the category that we call the factory hot rods. Talk a little bit about pro stock uh, for the folks out there. It's a naturally aspirated category. We're not talking about power adders, but it is also one of the closest classes in all of drag race. Yeah, it definitely is, Joe. And, and, and that's the big thing. It's They're door cars, as you said. They're not top field dragsters. They're not funny cars. They don't burn nitro. And the good side of that is they don't usually blow up. <laughs> you don't usually go down the racetrack in a Blazing Inferno. So that's kind of cool. I like that part of it because I really don't like fire. But uh, <laughs> bottom line to me is I got into this class it, it, because it, I felt that it was the most technologically advanced class as far as an engine building, uh, an engine builder side of the perspective comes from. I thought that's what the top of the mountain was in NHRA drag racing. And, and certainly not taking anything away from your top field dragsters and, and your nitro burning funny cars because they make so much horsepower. But Honestly, Joe, it's all because of that nitromethane they burn. And that's what makes the big power. They don't necessarily have to massage every single part in that engine like we do. So I, I consider, you know, this, this class to be more similar to your, your NASCAR, your Formula One, all those where they do have to massage every single part in that engine. And they have to try and find every exact horsepower they can extract out of that engine burning gasoline. You know, and, and with no power adders, with no blowers, with no turbos, with no superchargers of any kind. So it, it's, it, to me, it's the biggest challenge. It's the ultimate challenge in drag racing. And that's why I gravitated towards this class. And that's why I've stayed in it all this time. Excellent. And you had a great year. We already know you won your fifth championship. 99 career wins surpassed uh, in many ways. Your mentor, Warren Johnson, for career wins. We've got people checking in. Uh, this one, congratulations, Greg. I love watching you and your team. You did a great job for the Hendrick Automotive Group. A gentleman named John Bickford. John Bickford. Wow. How about that. Yeah, he, he oh, would know, there, sir. He <laughs> would know. It, it's interesting. You know, we, we, we find the more we learn about this whole deal, we find that not only do we pay attention to NASCAR, but they pay attention to us. So that's kind of cool to have that tie in. And, and obviously, you know, Jeff Gordon, everything he did over at Hendrick. He, you know, I was over there a week or so ago and they had their, the Randy Dorton engine building challenge, which was all their, their engine builders in their shop competing to see how fast they could put an engine together. And it was a, an incredible, an incredible deal. But you also found it in everybody you talk to, everybody pays attention to what we're doing over here, just like we pay attention to what they're doing over there. So it's a big family. And, and Jeff Gordon was the doggone happy. He was, he was like a kid at, at, at Christmas morning. It was a week after they had won their championship and he was still on cloud nine and just grinning ear to ear and, and, and excited as can be about their whole project, but still excited to watch me the coming the forthcoming weekend, see if we could close our deal. So I had a great time over there and, and, you know, it's just really a cool feeling to know that, that, that side of the, you know, we consider them our big brother, obviously NASCAR kind of our drag race, big brother, and they're watching us just as much as we're watching them. So I guarantee it happens in all forms of motorsports including Formula One. I certainly watch them, and I'll bet you even a few of them guys watch us occasionally. 
Let's uh, let's dig deeper into the relationship with uh, Rick Hendrick and the Hendrick Automotive Group because you had a long-standing relationship with Summit and you still do. Um, but Hendrick came on this year, and I don't know. I, my opinion is it it kind of um, it put pressure on you in a way that you responded to. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about it because you know drag racing is a community and it's a bubble and it survives and lives on its own. But when Hendrick Motorsports, and, and you have to look at the same logo on the side of Kyle Larson's car and the side of your car, and he won, and, and, and now you, you want to win, like, that was a whole new universe, at least that's what it appeared to be. So talk a little bit about the relationship with Hendrick Motorsports and how it did drive you. It absolutely drove me. It, it, it completely made me realize that if I didn't up my game, if I didn't find a way to become, you know, to the top of the class and find a way to win races, win championships, it would be a one and done year, be a one year and done deal, a, a, a failed experiment by Rick Hendrick. Now, obviously, Rick Hendrick, he believes in winners. He's a winner. He knows how to win. His entire operation is built on winning. And he selected me, and that told me that he had faith in me as a winner. So I had to go out and prove that I could win again. And, and you know, I hadn't won a championship in, in 10, 11 years. So not that I hadn't been able to win races and, and still compete for championships, but I hadn't just just hadn't closed the deal. I hadn't got the, the job done. And when he put his faith in me, it, it absolutely lit a, a new fire inside of me. And every week I watched Kyle Larson go out there and just destroy the competition. I would go to my race thinking, man, if I do any less than that, I'm a failure. So it, it definitely, I've always liked that. I've always liked the extra pressure. I've always liked the, when we would go to, to Norwalk Summit Raceway Park and Summit's all over the side of my car, that seemed to drive us harder. And I seemed to have more success when that pressure ratcheted up. So same thing happened here with, with the Hendrick group jumping on and with what they were doing over there and, and with, you know, they're taking a leap, taking a, a leap of faith on me. And, and I just didn't want to let them down. And that seems to be my recipe for doing well. I guess the extra pressure, as you, you would say, seems to light a fire in me. And, and I guess I need that extra jolt sometimes. Well, and it was a year of a lot of extra things going on and you chase a milestone and everybody in all motorsports and sport knows that when you get close to these milestones, the attention is increased and everybody wants to know everything. This year, Greg was trying to tie and surpass the 97 career win total of Warren Johnson, the professor, who to many people is the greatest engine builder of all time. You know, Warren is a, a legend. Greg, you you worked for Warren for 12 years. You were there for the first 200 mile per hour run. And, and you knew the numbers. You were getting close to this milestone and um, it was it was difficult getting close and breaking through a milestone. Talk a little bit about the 97 wins, the 97th win, the 98th win, and uh, and how that weighed on you over the course of the season when really the goal is to win the championship. But we were asking you at every single race about this milestone. Yep, it, and, and it was, and it, it certainly does, I guess, put extra pressure on you. But I was all right with that. Number one, I seemed to like the extra pressure. Number two, the goal was to go win a race. If you win a race, you get closer to or tie or set the record, right? So all that brings is the most points you could get. You win the race, you get the most points you could get. That helps you towards winning a championship. So it wasn't two separate goals. It wasn't that I was trying to, you know, concentrate on doing that, but that might affect my chances to win a championship. If I found a way to win and tie the record and break the record, that would help me find a way to win the championship. So it was kind of a cool deal that it tied together like that. You don't always have it like that. So it wasn't a distraction at all to me. I, I, I welcomed it and I, and I liked every bit of it. So I had a blast this year. And, and you know, in the last few years, it's, it's kind of been a bit of a, a snail's pace of, of winning races. It's just the competition is incredible out there. And, and anybody can beat anybody right now. So you don't see many teams going on a, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight race win streak through the season. It, it just, it doesn't happen. The cars are too even. So there's not really any dominance anymore. So I knew it was going to take a while. And that's the way records should be. They should be extra painful. They should be harder to get. And this was certainly hard to get at the pace you're able to win races these days. But I never gave up faith. I never gave up hope. I just hope we could keep racing long enough to get it done. And then we get the pandemic come in and you, you, you don't even know if you'll be able to race at all. And then we end up patching together seven or eight or nine races in a season. And, and you know, man, if it, it continues like that, then it may never happen. But luckily the floodgates kind of opened this year and, and, you know, we were able to race a full schedule and, and we had a great, great car all year long. And then it'll bring on the Hendrick group and, and it, just all of those things together just 
propelled us to a great season and the performance of the race car was fantastic all year. Obviously I couldn't have won the race that I did if I didn't have the horse to ride that I had. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to the team. It's, it's a team sport without a doubt. And it's not a Greg Anderson record. It's a KB racing record. I wouldn't have won all those races without this KB racing team and all my great you know, team members and crew chiefs and team owner. It, it just, it starts at the top with Ken Black and uh, I'm just blessed to have everybody around me that I've got or I'd be nothing. I'd be absolutely nothing without them. Well, I, I no, I, I think it's great. You had more number one qualifiers than anybody else this year, multiple race wins, and you won the championship. Uh, we got some questions queuing up that are a little more technical. I do want to get to them. If you got a question for Greg, put it in the chat section. But uh, since you, you brought up, you know, NHRA, and we just heard from Antron Brown. You know Antron. He's going out on his own. He started a team. He says there's all kinds of great news and announcements and people reaching out to be involved. You just told the story of Rick Hendrick reaching out into drag racing, likes drag racing to support you. We know Tony Stewart is starting a drag racing team. You've been involved with the sport for a long time. What is the state of the NHRA and drag racing in general, in your opinion? Well, I honestly think it's great, Joe. And, and, and even to boil it down towards not just the entire sport, but this class in particular, we, we, we had one leg in the grave two, three years ago, and, and we had to make severe changes to get car count back up and be able to keep this class going. And, and I thought, you know, as things are going on, I, I want this class to keep going. I know I can't go forever, but I've got a son. Everybody that races this class is probably advancing in age. They have sons that want to get involved. And if we don't have a class for them to get involved with, we're going to feel really bad. So luckily we made some, some great moves and we got the class back on its feet and saved it. And, and the rest of the sport has kind of paid attention and they're making moves to do the same thing. So the sport in general, I think is absolutely on the rise. It's definitely coming back at a couple of year lull maybe, but it's coming back and it's getting stronger, stronger as the years go by. So I now have faith that it's going to be around a while. And I could have said that a couple of years ago. Brad Gerber going to be joining us next, by the way. So he's going to give us some big picture stuff. All right. Here's a question from Tim. Uh, okay. Would you, this is, you know, the technical side of, of, of pro stock. It's a question that I feel like we've evolved beyond, but I want your opinion. Would you prefer carburetors and hood scoops or electronic fuel injection and no scoops uh, or EFI and scoops and why? So talk a little bit about that whole transition from the old world carburetor technology to the new EFI stuff and how you like it, how it's worked out, and maybe what you would like to see um, in the future. Well, I made, I made no bones about it. When we first started this deal, I wasn't in favor of it because number one, Joe, I didn't hardly know how to turn a laptop computer on. And, and that's not a lie. I was the guy that said that, that computers, computers, that, that'll never catch on. You know, that was 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, that'll never catch on. So I was a little wrong about that. And <laughs> I, I had to go into this changeover, this steel injection changeover, kind of dragging and kicking and screaming. I didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it but we had to buckle down and we had to accept it. And we had to learn. We had to learn how to turn on that computer. We had to learn how to tune that engine. And, you know, we had a great season when we started out. I think it was 2016. That was the first year we had a great year, even though we made no bones about it. We knew nothing about it. So apparently the rest of the class didn't either. And, and we just did least worst, I guess, that year. And we were able to win the majority of the races. So it ended up being okay. As now the years have gone by and we're, we're, we're pecking away, we're chipping away at it. I'm okay with it. But would I rather go back to a carburetor and a hood scoop? You're darn right I would, because the honest truth is we're still not back power level where we were before we switched. And I've said it a million times before, I'm a racer, I just want to go fast. I, I just <sighs> go fast. So I don't want to go race when I have less power than I had a year before. I want more every year. So that, that's what it's all about to me. So I'd go back to heart and carburetors in a heartbeat. And, and uh, you know, it, it's... It's not necessarily just the carburetor or the fuel injection. We made a lot of changes. We lowered the RPM limit of the engine. You know, we were probably running our engines close to 12,000 RPM at the time they made the rule change. And now we, we capped them off at 10.5, at 10,500 RPM. So that was a big change. The way we have to bring the air into the engine, it, it enters the front of the race car, basically three inches off the bottom of the ground, which is a hot black asphalt track. So you got hot air most of the time coming into the engine. It's got to come up. Through a, through a K&N duct and it's got to make a 90 degree turn and go into the intake manifold. It's just not happy. The whole deal is just not that happy. If we could run fuel injection with say a hood scoop and two big, basically throttle bodies up top to run our fuel injection, then I'd probably 
say, man, we could probably make it run just as good or better than we could with a carburetor, but that's not the way it is. So a lot of changes. It wasn't just the fuel injection. It was the hood scoop and all those other things we had to do that, that basically chopped us down in power. So it's, it's more of the rule package now altogether, what slowed us down. And I just want to go fast. You know, that's bringing carburetors and a hood scoop back. You bet. I'm all about it. Okay, so I would push back and say no, no going back to carburetors, but something that makes you go faster, yes. So uh, I love seeing you guys work on maps and and fuel injection. And to me, I think it's just so relevant to youth out there, youth who are involved in in motors. They get in, they're messing with tunes, they can relate to their own car. You get a Camaro on the street, you want to first thing you want to do is change the tune. And I love being able to compare that to what's going on in the NHRA. But Faster, better, definitely. Let's talk about that final race. You come into the world finals, the Auto Club finals at Auto Club Raceway. It's the final race of the NHRA season. And you're in a two-horse race, for the most part, not mathematically, with one of the greatest drivers ever. We were just talking diversity in the sport with Antron Brown, Erica Enders, who either she or you was going to win your fifth championship. You know she's an assassin on the starting line one of the greatest to hold a steering wheel. And uh, you guys battled. You battled and ultimately had to race each other uh, in the semifinal round. Just talk a little bit about that experience and, you know, squaring up with Erica. who got her first win against you, and and you guys battled, and and you got a championship against her at the end. Uh, Talk a little bit about that that just great person. I think, uh, you know, Senna and Prost, I think of all these battles, and Enders and Anderson – uh, for the drag racing world is legendary. Yep, no, no doubt that that was our dream scenario. And it wasn't, an, certainly wasn't an automatic, wasn't a given we had of the 10 cars in the countdown or 11 cars in the countdown, you could have factored in every one of them as a possible champion at the end of the year. So for us to, to make it to the final race, basically the only ones alive, that was the big bullet dodged right there. Okay, so now we settle it out amongst ourselves. And then as the ladder finally settled out and shook out, if we were find, gonna find our way through the rounds, we would meet up in a semifinal. So what more could you ask? That was absolutely all you could ask for. Would you wanna settle it? Mono we mono, absolutely positively. And I'm sure she'd say the same thing. That's the best way for it to happen. And, and the win came down for me. It, it basically was a result of, just like when Kyle Larson had the, the best pit stop on the last stop to win that race, that final race. It was my team that got me set up on the ladder where I got set up got me lane choice every round on Sunday. And that lane choice absolutely came into play when we ran in the semifinal and she had trouble with the other lane, but that was earned by basically by my race team, that lane choice. So a team effort, complete team effort. And, and, you know, we were able to get by her there because she had trouble with the racetrack and and, uh, basically a complete team effort. So just how you'd like to have it all shake out. And and, uh, I'm sure not in her opinion, but on our opinion, that's absolutely the perfect scenario a complete team effort. We all got it done together. And without any one of those things happening, we wouldn't have won it. So pretty cool deal as it all turned out. It's been 10 or 11 years since I felt that feeling. Fantastic feeling. I'm still smiling everywhere I walk, everywhere I go. And and, uh, it's going to be three more months before we race or two and a half more months. And I guarantee that smile is not going to go away for two and a half more months. Yeah, but you're not resting and she's not going anywhere either. And I think that this is going to continue on to the entertainment of uh, everybody out there and hopefully new fans who are not really involved in the sport just yet are starting to turn on to NHRA drag racing and realize that, you know, if you don't like one class, there's definitely something in there that you will like and appreciate. Something else I think that's kind of interesting is you're, you're, you're mentoring a new generation of drivers. Uh, we spoke the other day and we listed all the people that were in the top 10 the last time you won the championship versus all the people that are in the top 10 now. And you're the only driver still around from the era. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but you've got a, a whole crop of young in, in kind of the mold of every other motorsport. You look at Formula One, you look at NASCAR, it's this new wave of youth drivers. That is true at KB Racing with your team. And it is true in Pro Stock. It, it, it's not, uh, Joe, it's not only youth, new drivers, rookie drivers, it's rookie drivers that are jumping in equipment that, that is absolutely capable of winning races, winning championships right off the bat. They're jumping in the same exact equipment that I've got, running the same exact engine that I've got, same exact engine that Eric Anders has got, and, and they have all this youth and enthusiasm and, and 
lack of fear. They don't fear anybody. They don't really care how many races the guy in the other lanes won. They're just out to have fun and 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 kick ass. So pretty cool deal. And and we got a great crop of them. It's like they're not as it, they're rookies in this class, but they're not rookies as far as driving race cars. And and so they've driven different kinds of race cars in the past, and they jumped into this deal like every one of them, like seamlessly, like 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 they've been riding a horse forever all their life. So pretty cool to see the talent that's in the class right now and, and pretty proud to be a part of it. And it's kind of funny that I'm the only one left after 10 years, Eric and I are the only ones left and it's a complete shakeout and still somehow we found a way to make it to the end of the year and, and be the last two horses survive. So pretty cool deal. And as I said, I, I honestly feel like we dodged a bullet. We dodged that youth bullet this year. Can we do it again next year? We're sure going to try, but I'm telling you, the odds are starting to stack against us. There, there's more and more every year. And the talent level is just incredible, Joe. Incredible. It, well, it is. And, and those of people out there that are interested, you can follow Greg on Twitter. Just search for Greg Anderson and, of course, NHRA and KB Racing. A um, couple of rapid-fire questions. Uh, Luxembourg checking in, loving the panelists this week. Um, John says, John Bickford says, uh, you mentioned your son. You mentioned Cody was an ace golfer by the way is he following in your footsteps would you would you call what cody's doing following in your footsteps greg <laughs> not quite yet he's got a few more years to put in i put in uh let's see about uh 20 25 years of, of, of working on race cars driving the truck driving the tractor trailer up and down the road and all that before i even thought about driving a race car so he's got plenty of time and, and i can't tell him every day don't get nervous you're, you're young yet you're 23 years old you got plenty of time to do this he need to learn more of the race car yet. So he's, you know, as of three year, about two or three years ago, he couldn't change a spark plug in an engine. So he's come a long way in the last two, three years. His number one passion was golf, probably still is, but he's getting more and more involved and more interested and in learning more every day with his drag race deal. And, and, and I want him to learn a little more about the car before he gets a chance to drive. But someday I would love to see him get a chance to drive one. And uh, he's probably going to have to push this old goat out of the seat for it to happen. And I don't know how long that's going to be yet. So. I can't put a date on it yet, but hopefully someday it'll happen. Hopefully someday I can stand on the starting line and feel that proud feeling that some of these guys have had that, that have got out of the car before and had their sons drive. They claim there's nothing better. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool driving them, but they claim that's a better deal yet. It's like the grandfather deal. There's nothing better than being a grandpa. The dad's cool, but there's nothing better than being a grandpa. So it'll be the same type of deal. Oh, I love it. And Cody works on the car now. He does the back half. And, and so he's a, a hands-on kind of guy. All right, here, here's one more. And then I have a question about the technology and pro stock. Uh, Jay wants to know if KB is going to be involved with the new factory experimental category that the NHRA has announced. And for those that don't know, it's basically bodies that are restricted to absolute factory dimensions with the new power adder engines that we see in uh, you know factory showdown. Uh, supercharged Copo Camaro, Cobra Jet Mustangs, and Hemis, uh, but with Liberty transmission. So there'll be a clutch and shifting. So everyone is very excited about this category. Greg, what about you? And is KB going to be involved somehow? Well, we're definitely getting warmed up to it, Joe. I, we're not involved yet. And, and I would certainly never say never. So maybe someday we're not involved yet. We're going to like, let, you know, stand back a little bit and wait and see how it kind of shakes out. I love a lot of things about it. I love what you just said that the five speed transmissions versus an automatic that, that's right up my alley. I, I don't really, I'm not a big automatic type guy. So I love that part of it. The rest of it's going to be cool too. I just want to see kind of how it all lands and how it all shakes out. And, and probably someday we will, we will get involved. We're not jumping in just yet. We've got a lot of other projects going on here, you know, with, with all the customers we have in the pro stock class. And, and, and we do a lot of customer work for a lot of other things here at the shop too. So it's, the plate's kind of full right now but I'm never going to say never. It's certainly something could happen in the future, but as of today, no. Okay. In our final seconds, I do want to mention that Greg also mentored NHRA's rookie of the year, Dallas Glenn, who won three races and went to, I believe six final rounds. And Dallas has been a crew member on the team, worked his way up the hard way and, and goes out there and actually gets to live the dream. And that's something that happens in the NHRA where, you know, you work your way up and I, and I appreciate it. But in the final seconds, Greg, uh, thermal efficiency, right? Everybody thinks about Formula One engines as like the pinnacle and the peak, and they are, and I get it. They have the most R&D and they have the most technology. But from what I understand, to make 1,500 horsepower out of 500 cubic inches naturally aspirated on gasoline is really a miracle of modern engine building. And I don't know that the world understands exactly what's going on. 
we've done seminars with people who do high temperature and high tech coatings or pistons and ring. And every time they're talking about this technology, cutting edge technology, I'm thinking, yeah, that's in a pro stock car. Yeah, that's in a pro stock car. That's in a pro stock car. Can you speak generally to the world out there just about what's going on in front of the firewall and how amazing it is? Yes, it doesn't have a blower and it doesn't use nitro, but for the engine geeks out there, this is one of the top engines on the planet. It is. And, and, and as it's shaken out, Joe, there's not been that many people that have proven they can build an engine at that level. So it, it kind of weaves out the, you know, the wannabes, the tire kickers. It, it's three horsepower per cubic inch is basically what it is to, to make 1500 horse on, on, on a 500 cubic inch engine. So, you know, if you look at any of your engines, whether it's an NASCAR engine or any small blocks or anything, you don't ever hear anything over three three horsepower per cubic inch. So it's pretty impressive. And, and I've been around it a lot of years, worked a lot of years with Warren. And it's just every single day of your life, you work on all the internal components to that, that engine. And thank God it's been a class that hasn't been restricted completely by rules. So we, we're kind of wide open. We can do whatever we want, but we got to burn gasoline. So it, no power adders. So it just, every single piece of that engine is massaged every single day. And you find a horsepower here, a horsepower there. Pretty soon you got 1,500 horse out of 500 cubic inch. Amazing. Francisca and Judy are back. Greg, I just want to say congratulations to you. Thank you so much for being so gracious with your time. 99 wins. You've allowed us the opportunity to see 100 at some point in 2022. I know you'll have good luck. Happy holidays. And thank you for spending time with us here on Industry Week. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. It's been an honor. Happy holidays to all of you. The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing, and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade, there is no e-commerce. It's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR Trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. There are two types of people, racers and everyone else. Racer Magazine is for those who believe that racing is a way of life. Racer embodies the excellence that defines a sport driven by passion, courage, and ingenuity. Get one year of both Racer's print and digital edition for only $39 with instant access to our entire digital issue archive. Subscribe now at info.racer.com.